Well, hello, all you wiretappers out there. Uh, I, I forgot to turn the uh, video on on my Zoom call, so uh, I'm doing a little lead in here. This is going to be an interview with Ron Fino with a bunch of supporters uh, of the uh, podcast. So settle back and, and listen to uh, Mr. Undercover, one of the more interesting guys I've had the occasion to get to know over my years of being involved in this, um, what do you call this, the mafia entertainment business. Thank you. But uh, uh, Larry put one on, and, and uh, what about three years ago now, Larry? I can't mm -hmm. remember. Uh, and and uh, Ron was uh, was there, and so we uh, we got to talk. And I interviewed him actually for the podcast. So uh, if you've listened to his story on the podcast, you may have heard some of this before. But this chance time, you get to see him say it, and don't just mm -hmm. listen to him say some of it. And, and uh, Ron, if you will just uh, pause a little bit, we'll see if we, anybody's got any questions every once in a while. I sure, go ahead. Be, Whatever you'd like they, to they, these guys are all people who support the podcast uh, quite a little bit, and uh, uh, I like to uh, give them a little something extra, more than just a regular podcast each week. And uh, they're all all becoming friends of mine. We're just kind of having a monthly little Zoom chat fest here. And, and the, sometimes we get guests. We don't, you know, Paul Sharp from uh, uh, guys. Yes, Paul's get, a dear friend. You know Paul, us. yeah. And yeah. Uh, Paul came last time. and i uh, seen that. Oh, He's is, a okay. wonderful man that went he through is. a, tragic, a right. tragic period, and, and he's still going through it. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It, it was uh, a bunch of us met out there that I've kind of stayed in somewhat contact with uh, via social media, partly. And then my podcast, so I uh, stayed in, in contact with quite a few guys. Of course, Denny Griffin. Uh, I think yeah. most of you guys know who Denny Griffin is. And he came on here uh, when I first started. First time I did this, talk about Frank Culotta. So, uh, you know, I, I had a guy get hold me, a policeman I used to work with. And he sent me a link to an interview of Frank Culotta. He said, did you know this guy? Do you know this guy? He was pretty impressed with, uh, with what Frank was having to say because he was my sergeant in the intelligence unit. And he's thinking, dang, this guy's really laying it out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I didn't know Frank when he was in Chicago. Yeah. I knew all the players in Chicago, but I didn't know Frank. Uh, I didn't know Spalaccio either. I may have met him. Yeah. I wouldn't have recalled, you know, I wouldn't have recalled it because I was running in those days with uh, Vinny Solano and uh, Accardo. Oh, really? Interesting. So, yeah. uh, you know, Ron, why don't you tell us, uh, tell these guys a little bit about how you got started. Your dad was a, a Buffalo mob guy. And so yes, you, you my, came yeah. by it naturally here. Or uh... Well, my father was actually, the, the, became the boss or the so-called boss of the Buffalo Magadino Empire. And I grew up in it. I mean, I got to meet players from all over the world. It's just that I did not want to participate, nor did my father, believe it or not, want me to participate. And so I never joined. Uh, uh, I did become the head of the Labor's Local 210 and became <coughs> an officer for the Labor's International Union. So I did get to meet all the players in Chicago, New York City, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I didn't like the way the mob read any, everything because they were stealing from the members. And when I went with the FBI, I told them, I'll do what's ever necessary, but don't ever ask me about my father or my family. And you know, they never did. They never once did. Uh, I, I did uh, bring the Bureau up to speed on labor racketeering, or at least try, you know, one of the people that brought them up to speed on labor racketeering, as well as uh, some of the procedures that they were involved in uh, operations with the benefit funds, how they would bring back money and kickbacks, things of that nature. But also at the same time, you learned about killings. You learned about how the families operated um, and, and they opened up to you. It was, it's surprisingly, Chicago was always very open about how they operated as was uh, some parts of New York City, like the Genovese family. They were more open than some others. I knew them about the best. Uh, Gambino, as I knew, I knew a lot of Columbo's. Uh, Ralph uh, uh, Scopo was a, a friend of mine. He worked with them. He was the one that actually started the, the so-called Concrete Club uh, for Tony Salerno and all the you know the, the various families. So you get to meet them all, and you get. Hey, to Ron, see what, what yes. union? What, what union was that when you that you guys? I was I was with the Labor's International Union, uh, which was all mobbed up. We were mobbed up. Originally, we were controlled by the Chicago office, 
of, uh, I mean, the Chicago family took over the presidency. But because of New York's power and things like that, Chicago would uh, dare not step on their toes. They were allowed to maintain things as well throughout there in New England, uh, New York City, down to Florida. Uh, I mean, I, I knew Santo Traficanti quite well. I never met Marcello, but I knew Santo quite well. He opened up a plaza, a strip plaza they had up over near Tampa with him and Arthur Coy. So you get to meet the various players. And you get to see the real story. It's not like a lot of the movies that I, I never will degrade an author or you know, a, a besmirch an author because I know how difficult it is. That's like newspaper reporters. It's a very difficult thing. There is no such thing as an expert on organized crime. And that is the truth. No, everybody, and I was supposedly the FBI's expert. Well, uh, there's no such thing. Uh, as much as I know, it seems how little I really did know. Really? Hey, Ron, how, how did they first recruit you? Or did you just walk in? Were you what they call a walk in? Well, no, they were recruiting me for years. I didn't know that myself. I'll be they, honest. With you. They just drop by and say, hey, how you doing? And leave a card. Yeah, well, it seems that they had spotted me at an early age. Well, first of all, before I was with the FBI, I was doing work with the CIA. I worked with the CIA over, we had an office, at, uh, a satellite uh, center in Western New York. And uh, during the days of the SDS and things of that nature, well, someone broke into the uh, office and took all the CIA documents. And they came to me to see if I could locate them because I happened to know somebody that was under suspicion, which I attempted to do. But when I met with the guy, he was so paranoid and out of it and drugged up, he was totally incoherent. Mm -hmm. And, he, and he, the only thing he had correct is, I mean, someone's watching me. Someone's watching. <laughs> yeah, they were watching. Look at the nail. You. <laughs> but the, I was never able to, you know, because he was so incoherent, he probably went uh, uh, crazy after that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was so drugged up. But we were never able to put that end together. But that led me into the FBI. And I was, I didn't know that the FBI was grooming me for a lot of years. They told me this later on. But uh, I was playing tennis one time, and uh, this Ron Hedinger happened to be on the other side of the court. And, and he says, Ron, he says, I'm Ron. And I says, I, we introduced each other to ourselves. And uh, he says, yeah, I'm with the FBI, Ron. And I says, I'm with Local 210, Ron. <laughs> and, 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 but we became buddies. Uh, I mean, they, they nurtured it properly. They were smart about it and how they... Uh, work me in. And, and then it was me that was critical. I was critical of the FBI for not doing enough to protect the working class. The, you know, I seen the ripoffs and I was, you know, I, I totally berated them over that. And he says, well, if someone like you could help, and that's where it first came out of my mouth. I says, I'll help. But the only thing is just leave my family out of this. And you know, for, for the rest of the time, they never asked me once about my family, never once. And, and, and I, so I don't know if you want to call it a walk-in or being groomed or what, whatever you want to, I don't, I don't even know that, but I, I, they listed me as a contractor. I was an operative or a contractor at, at, at the various reports. When we would do 302s, then they would, or sometimes they would use me as what was called source one, source two, source three, yeah. things of that nature. And I did that for 35 years. Wow. 35 years. Uh, I did some other CIA work. As you know, I went overseas to Europe and I, I, I worked in uh, Eastern Europe, especially uh, arms smuggling, Al Qaeda. Most of it was arms smuggling in Russia mafia, but it was Al Qaeda ties as a result of all that. When you would go to another city, for example, you had some later union deals you had to deal with and did somebody make a connection for you? Like if you went to uh, somebody introduced you to Tropicante, if you had to go down there and, and do something in, in Florida or Cleveland, you went to Cleveland, I believe, once. And yeah, no, I was to... Cleveland quite a lot. No, I knew Jack Lacavelli, the boss of Cleveland, quite well. Uh, when I was introduced to was by the Sammy Pieri, who was, a, he knew them all. He was a, a, a Magadino family, but very close to the Genovese's. Was very close to as, as a lot of those families, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Cleveland, were all close to the Genovese family. Yeah, a lot of people get that story wrong, but the, they were all very tied in. And uh, when I went down there, Lecavelli would send me wine every year, it was good wine. I mean, he used to make his whole bait wine. I went out to dinner with him and Macy Rockman. Macy, when you see about the presser story, I mean, presser was a buffoon, 
I mean, I could not believe he was a union official. This guy didn't know what was up or down uh, when it came to union work. So Luke Cavelli wanted me to work with the Teamsters. He wanted me to go over there and help them with the Teamsters. And uh, uh, Macy Rockman, who was Presser's uncle, came over. And he did have the string ties, if you ever see the, uh, I guess there was a film out there. He always talk about the cowboy string ties. Well, he did. Oh, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, Buffalo would never allow that. They wanted me to stay with the laborers, nor would New York City allow that. I was, uh, you know, I was groomed for the laborers international. And that's where they wanted me to stay. Little did they know what I was doing for a living. <laughs> now, now, you were always, uh, uh, somebody would ask you who you're with. You'd always say you were with Buffalo. Is that? Well, now, what we do is uh, I'd be introduced as a relative of a friend. Uh, or uh, sometimes, you know, you know, I'm my own made man. They would say, well, I'm not. I'm told. A lot of times they would say, I'm my own man, you know. Uh, so that's where the made man came in yeah. eventually because they'd say, I'm my own man. And and when you would meet with them, I mean, a lot of them opened up, especially in times of panic. That's when you'd get things. Uh, that's like with the, uh, New York City. I mean, you get to know them all. I mean, I never met... Uh, uh, the Chin Gigante, or if I met Salerno, I don't know if I did or I didn't. Uh, I never met John Gotti. I didn't know much about John Gotti, but I did know, uh, you know, Joe Piney, Armon, uh, people behind, you know, the organization there. They were friends about Joe and Gallo that were Gambinos. I knew quite a few of them. Uh, Louis Giardina, in fact, uh, Tom Farinella, the attorney for Gravano, came to me for help. He wanted me to help Gravano when he was still in jail, but I couldn't do that. You know that. Uh, he, but I said, so it's too late. What could he offer? <laughs> the problem with that is a lot of people don't know he took the rap for his kids. <laughs> Gravano. Oh, uh, no, you mean the uh, the ecstasy yeah. thing, the most recent? Yeah, thing? yeah, he took the rap for his kids. I wonder yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, he did. But I mean, he killed all these people. How could I forgive? Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah. You, you know, how do you forgive? How do you forgive? They killed all these people. I, you know, people say, well, that's when they turn sort to informant. I'll respect them for that if they really try to clean their act up. But as far as uh, their past, how could I forgive them? You can't. I mean, that's what I fought all my life. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Gravano is he's starting into this mob entertainment business. I don't know if you've noticed or not. He's got him a. Uh, YouTube channel called The Bull or <laughs> something like that. He tell, he's <laughs> a good storyteller. Right? I'll say that. That guy's a good storyteller. Is he really? Can he talk? Yeah, yeah he can talk. Story. He can talk. It, yeah. It's pretty highly uh, produced. I mean, they have uh, great cameras and they, they have real smooth shifts from one camera to the other. And you can tell it's it's pretty well produced. But when he's telling a story, it's natural. And, and he's a pretty good storyteller. I, I got a guy that kind of knows him and He's been trying to, to talk to him, see if we can. I can't get him on the podcast, but I can see that's not coming unless I offer him some money. He's yeah, already exactly talking about money. Wants. I yeah. can tell you, he talked about that early on. Uh, <laughs> he, he wants his money. It's like, yeah. when, you know, when Frank started, okay, but then after a while, Frankie uh, <laughs> yeah. had to get his money. I mean, yeah. you know, he's going to be in the film they're making. I mean, whether it, whenever it comes out, I yeah. don't know. I mean, right yeah. now, COVID's got everything still. Yeah, really. Frank gave me a podcast, but I, it might be one of the last free ones he did. <laughs> he, he remembered me from those Mob World Summit things. And I'd, I'd send a couple of people like Barry, uh, one of the guys yeah. on here. He went out now. I'd, I'd send people out to do his tour, and I'd say, now tell him that I sent you. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I talked to him a couple of weeks before he passed away. Oh, really? We were talking on the phone. Yeah, he said he was ill. I mean, you yeah. could tell he was going. The, when the last time I'd seen him, uh, when he was filming for my, uh, the, the documentary that they're making on me, uh, we were at the, uh, the same place that uh, De Niro used, Tim and Sharon Stone, as their as the residence of uh, uh, what's the name, Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. yeah, I knew Rosenthal real well. He was. Oh, did you? Yeah, I knew him real well. How, how did you? Uh, well, let's let me let me go back. Let me kind of do this a little more methodically. I you got a great story if I remember right about the snow removal contract with the outfit. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I was, you know, that was actually, you know, a, a legitimate thing I put together to do snow removal. Being from Buffalo, New York, we know how to move you're, snow. You're experts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know how to move it. And without, you know, you, you don't, one of the problems I had all the time is people cheating because you got to be pretty honest. Uh, 
when you do it. Uh, and it, it's because you're making enough money. You don't have to, to cheat on something like that. And uh, so what I would always do when I put my crew together, I would represent, I would, I wanted representatives of the Army Corps of Engineers with me to keep track of all our, you know, machinery, when it's working, when it isn't. So I don't have to look over my shoulder because even with us, I caught some, some of my subcontractors cheating. So it made it a lot, lot easier. But when I went to Chicago, it was actually Pete Chavarilli, the guy that was behind uh, the group Chicago. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I've heard of Chicago, yeah. yeah. Pete Chavarilli was the manager. And he was, the, he was part of the Streets Commission, uh, Commissioner's Office. And when they were hit in, I mean, they got these blue buses going up and down the streets, and they didn't know all they're doing is making ruts, mm -hmm. making it harder to remove. And I went in and I talked with this Tom Howe. I talked with Donovan, who was actually running things. He was the daily protege. He was running things for Mayor Blandick. And I talked with Mayor Blandick. I had Mayor Blandick and I on national TV over what a mess it was and, and why the Army Corps has to come in and help bail them out. Thompson, the governor, wasn't doing much. Uh, so what we did is I ended up bringing in equipment from all over the East Coast. And we, we, we set up snow command. I was using uh, City Hall as well as, uh, you know, to, to set up my snow command. And I explained to them that when we remove snow, we never want to be moving the machinery out of the snow area. You bring the fuel to the machinery. You keep track of the fuel because that's expensive. And uh, the, 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 the same with the drivers. When they go back and forth, you, you transfer them back and forth to the hotel instead of having that machine move. This way we constantly keep moving snow. And it was doing quite well. They had people coming over watching our procedures, especially in Chicago with all the, the, the damn the dead end streets. It was tough. Cars were buried. It was it was a it was a nightmare. It was the worst I've ever seen. And I did the blizzard of 77 in Buffalo. I did New England in 78, but nothing like this. And, and that was my side thing. You know, I, we, we enjoyed removing snow. Plus, you rescued a lot of people. You'd be surprised at the people you pull out stranded in their vehicles that are going through hypothermia, and they don't know it. Man. But uh, as a result, though, the, the mob got a hold of me. I was going to say, now I know the outfit wanted a piece of yeah, that. They wanted, had a well, big contract. They already, no, they already had pieces of it. They didn't want to, They did not ask one penny from me. Never one penny from me. They knew I was there. And uh, finally, Cup's column, Cup Chetik, wrote about it. He says, I had enough connections to make a federal agent's nose quiver. <laughs> <laughs> Snow command. Yeah. But we, uh, we helped organize the city. We were doing, you know, a, a lot. By the end, uh, I mean, you really don't make the money you think you do. The employees make the money. Yeah. You know, they make the money. You don't Would you have money. a contract with the Corps of Engineers and then when there's a big blizzard, then the they would, would ask call. for help and they would move you to certain yeah. places? Yeah. Well, it was good with the, the the big thing about the Corps of Engineers were, were two things. You had set rates. We had what we call Davis-Bacon rates so that we had the proper rates for the machinery, proper rates for the employees, uh, as well as, uh, you know, we, we would have logistics fuel moving our equipment in and out because you have to get the equipment there. And some of this stuff is big. You have to break it down and put in three uh, uh, low boys. That's the type of truck you carry it with them. We have huge, huge uh, snowplow equipment. And you plus you would be running it or you'd be subcontracted a lot as well. You did, our job was organizing. Even though we had our own equipment, it was more bringing in quick people, organizing the operations. And, and avoid being, we even had, like, we would put signs on the trucks so we knew which ones were ours. But in the meantime, we found a lot of other companies put signs on their trucks, uh, we're putting them, making our signs and putting them on their trucks and jumping in our lines so they could be counted. <laughs> so there was a lot of cheating going on. That was the problem. The mob was involved in a lot of cheating. And they were making money. But they never questioned me yet. No one ever said because they knew who I was. So they weren't going to bother me. I, I mean, I knew Ricardo quite well. He was always a gentleman with me. Uh, and, and Ernie Comoro, his son, son-in-law, was a friend of mine. Uh, uh, Joey Maz, uh, his other man. So I, I knew all the people around him. Vinny Solano, of course. Uh, 
Johnny Serpico. I could go on and on. Yeah, yeah. You, you get to know them all. I mean, not all of them. It's like uh, Sammy Winks Carlisi I knew quite well. because his brother Roy I, I knew as well. So uh, Joey Ayupa was close to my father. But uh, you get to know them, and uh, some some are very humble. Johnny Riggy from uh, Jersey, uh, very humble. Very. Uh, it, it was difficult for me to testify against him because I liked the guy. Hmm. I mean, we were always close. He was always a gentleman with me. So it becomes difficult. But then you have to, that's because of what your knowledge is. You don't see the knowledge that other people have of, uh, you know, I mean, these people kill people. Yeah. And I mean, they're in that business. And you know they have to approve the killing. They're in the family. They're in the, they're in the business, the industry. So uh, you mentioned on uh, Facebook today that you testified at the uh, trial for uh, the murders of uh, Herbie Blitzstein. Uh, that was out in Las Vegas. And yes, I did. How did you get involved in that? You, and you said you knew well, Rosenthal. I knew a lot of the your, or Tell us about how did you get connected up in Vegas like that? Well, I knew a lot. Well, we always knew Vegas. We were always gonna, had connections in Vegas. We had connections to the Tropicana, Caesar's Palace when they had points. Uh, they used to have what they call the point system, and that's how the mob would get involved. The Stardust, uh, we knew people that would get hired over to Stardust. Besides, I mean, Lefty or the, those people, we knew a lot of other people that would get hired by the various casinos. The mob would get them in, even MGM, all of them. I mean, the mob had that kind of strength back then in, in uh, the, the industry, the, the Las Vegas industry. So you got to know them all. And uh, one time when we were out there, we had to make sure that they picked me up, the bureau. Otherwise, it would have looked bad. Uh, they were picking everybody else up. When outsiders are coming in. They were pulling them over. Oh. And I, you know, it was a show. So I, as, for, as for show, I had to have them stop me as well, uh, just to put the show on, to keep the show going. <laughs> but you got to know them. All. And it was, it wasn't just the casinos. It was a meeting place where they would get together and they could talk. They'd go in the, the swimming pools or places like that where they felt they could get away with things. But in the Blitzstein case, I, I knew some of the people involved in, in the killing and uh, the, that were behind it in the robbery of, of uh, Fat Herbie. There was uh, Bobby Panaro, uh, uh, Samuel Legatuda, a few others that I knew that were I did this cat for get out of here, you bum you. I get a cat. I get cats to, the cat this this cat's always with me at night, so <laughs> uh, but I mean I, I knew quite a few players. I I don't know if I ever knew Blitzney. Uh, but I may have I probably did meet him. I met so many players. We uh, and I know so many different people from Chicago, I just don't remember the names. I, I probably did meet Spalaccio. But because I was meeting so many people, and I'm with uh, the, what you might as well refer to as the higher ups, yeah. they would, uh, you know, they'd be, hi, Mr. Fino, or something like that. They would take that kind of attitude. Well, what kind of union scams were they pulling that, uh, where they were stealing from the unions that you? Well, you most, uh, there's two ways. R rarely do they take it out of uh, the, the union dues or something, it's usually the benefit funds. Uh, some of the easy ways to do it is take, like, for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. You take the pension funds. These pension funds have millions and millions of dollars. And uh, they know a company. Uh, the company wants to, go, you know, uh, everybody wants to make some money. So they get this, this small company and you go around the country and you get about 20 or 30 unions to invest in that company. Well, the stock goes from, you know, 30 cents to six dollars, you know, a share. And what they did in the meantime, before they, while they were, while they were pumping it up, they had their relatives buy low or a friend, they could have been different people, buy low and buy plenty of shares. And then, of course, after the unions invested, they would pull their, you know, their money out to be in the friend or the family member. That was a scam that was a very successful scam for them. Others, they, uh, they had insider trading. They would know when to buy uh, because of the amounts of money you had. You had to invest and you had to control all these millions and millions of dollars. There's a lot of, I mean, even uh, you, you sway people from insurance companies looking to bribe you. I mean, I've been, you know, I've had people try to bribe me in the past, a lot of them. And it's like the dental clinic that we had in Cleveland and in uh, 
uh, in Buffalo and they were setting up for Johnny Riggy in Jersey. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the car and I get offered money. I, I, I can't refuse. I'm with the mob. You know, if I refuse, all the flags go up. So they said, well, here's this is for you and your father. So I took the money. And at that time, we had uh, my friends of mine in the strike force before they changed the leadership, Al Hartle and that. And I just turned the money over to them because I couldn't keep it. I told my father about it. I said, I can't keep this. He says, I understand. So my father, we went through like a role reversal at the end. Uh, and I, you know, so I had to turn it in, of course. I'm not going to hang on to bribe money. Even though, you know, I, I let him know still you don't want to. Yeah. Um, it on so that so most most of your time was really as like a, a deep throat, top echelon kind of informant that you, you weren't really, you, you didn't, weren't going to testify. They were never going to surface you for a long time. Yes, so you just correct. fed little tidbits to help them put things together. Well, that was more than little tidbits because it was quite a lot of it. There's yeah. over, I have over, I think, 5,000 302s. Oh, wow. So, uh, <laughs> and that's not counting 20, uh, uh, DOL, Department of Labor, I forget the form was 23 or forget what it was. Yeah. And, and of course, CIA work because I was at the Canadian border. Uh, so, but it was, I wouldn't, we, we never liked the term uh, informant because it was too synonymous with someone being flipped. Yeah. You know, they're making a deal. Uh, it's, it's not coming from the heart. It's not genuine. Uh, one of the problems I always had myself with the informants, I always had a problem is that the Justice Department would say, the more you tell us, the better off, the better deal you're going to get. And they would have a tendency to, to exaggerate, to get themselves a better deal. Yeah, You, you can't do that. And one of the things I, I brought up is I was teaching classes at the academy, at the Quantico, and I would bring up the fact that don't do this. Don't do that. Whatever it is, because they'll self-destruct at the stand. And I've seen it happen time in and time out. They get up there and if you, they can carry a lie just so far. Sooner or later, it's, they're going to trip over it. And, and that's what happens. And I've seen that. Uh, Henry Hill did that. Uh, he did it over Pauli Vario. Now, I knew Big Pauli. I knew the Varios very, very well. Local 66, Spike LaBarba, Petey Vario. I knew them all. And I mean, he put Polly Vario uh, in a place in New York when he was down in Florida in the hospital. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to be careful, you know, as, as an agent or as an investigator or, or a prosecutor, you got to be careful because you'll, you can, you can, some of these people can self destruct. Yeah, Anybody got any questions I want to ask Ron? Not yet. I'm just enjoying listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a curator. Well, I, I got, I got so. one for Ron. Sorry. Okay, here's what. Um, sorry I was late, fellas. I was I was in hair to make up a little too long, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can tell. But, uh, we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, anyways, uh, so Ron, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty crazy story I heard. So so you you, you were in the FBI, correct? That's You are an agent? Or? No, I was not an agent. I worked under contract. We okay. had call a personal services agreement and so I'll, uh, that's why we call they call people such as me as contractors or mm -hmm. operators okay. well, sorry, I, did, I, I did work I under contract okay. what's that oh, sorry. if I would have got here if I would have got here on time I would have been through this sorry yeah, you know, like, yeah. that's uh, right so you know, were you like, just like, a, like a private investigator to begin with or was it were you any kind of or mm -hmm. just, a, just a civilian or no I was a civilian I was a union official but I was connected to the mob Okay. Uh, okay. I was connected, highly connected around the country. I, knew well, I, most guess, I guess with that, you have no choice in that, in that line of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I never became a mobster. What, what's I kind of interesting is a lot of people what, don't understand this. They, like you say, Ron, everybody thinks that you're an informant or somebody, they, they flipped you. But yeah, no, you yeah. and you and I, there was a couple of people here. I know Red with Matt was like this. That's they didn't, they didn't have a case on him. Yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's, what, that's what I was getting at. So uh, is he was like a like a red or You're just like this is these guys are these guys aren't what they say. You just got fed up and just say like, this is just. Well, it wasn't just it wasn't just that. I guess I don't. Maybe it was. I was fed up with them. I didn't like them uh, because be prior to that, I did do some CIA work. Uh, oh really? So yeah. Maybe I had a little of that, that 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 life in me. But I'll tell you <laughs> this: when I worked overseas in Europe. Uh, and I spent a lot of years working Russian mafia, and I worked oh, into my God. 
<laughs> and uh, it's not, it's no James Bond story. No, yeah, yeah, I bet they don't have all 007. They don't have all that, yeah. yeah I mean, because, I could yeah. speak Russian, but that's uh, really? a, a little Italian and German, but that's about it. So, Ron, how did, how did you get into the Russian mafia? How did, did they catch you in, or do you, uh, you have some Russian no, connection what, came up? Yeah, well, I had, uh, it's not the Russians. I, I ended up weaving myself into it. I ended up representing the, uh, the Russian government on Stolichin of Vodka. They were having a problem that it was stolen during the Yeltsin era uh, by Yuri Schiffler and Boris Berezovsky. And so uh, we, we had a liquor company here. And we, so we decided, I decided to help them with that. So I became close to Loganov, who was the head of the Soyuz Plot Import. That's the arm of the Russian mafia. I got to see everybody on that. I've been in Putin's office. Uh, uh, a deputy foreign minister of the Russian government brought me. So I knew a lot of people. Boris Borden. Uh, I also was involved in that spy swap. Uh, not to, there's a book out that we're in. They made me out to be the tough guy. It's called Best of Enemies, The Last Great Cold War Story. This was after Hansen went south on us, you know, sold out the secrets. Uh, that pretty Russian girl uh, who I happen to know quite well uh, uh, was the one selling secrets to back to the Russians. And uh, my job was to go get Gennady out of jail. So I get a call from the CIA and I ask, who's doing this with you? You're it, Ronnie. I'm it. I have nobody else, so you're on your own. So you're up to your own devices and how you do things. But we were successful eventually. At first, they welcomed me with open arms. I had a number of people from actually the Putin administration was actually helping me. Uh, I had a number of them. So it wasn't that they were out to kill them. There were people in the cage, the FSB, KGB, and then the FSB. Is that my phone? Let me make sure my plug is in here. Hang on. Yeah, let me plug my phone in here just to make sure. Are running down? <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure I plug my name. I would have been dead by now. Yeah. The phones are so smart, they just can't stay charged. Yeah, yeah, well, I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking of getting away. All right, there we go. Let's see if I get this picture back up here. There you go. Let's see. So that's, I mean, so that's crazy, Ronald. I mean, the, dealing with the Russian mafia, I mean, I have a little research on it in, in, in America. Yeah. They, make them, they make them all kind of look like, like kitty cats. Yeah. I mean, they're Russian mafia guys don't mess around. That's in this no, country. Like, imagine, like and, in their own country. I, I hear they still kind of run the whole damn country, basically. Is Benito is, is, is uh, uh, Rusky Mafia uh, Ochen Trudna. Ochen, Ochen Trudna. That means they're very hard. Uh, yeah. They're very difficult to deal with. And they're, they're, oh, they're yeah, dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, they're, I guarantee it. I mean, yeah. and that's nothing like... I, that's different. what I said in Russian, by the way. <laughs> so uh, Russians, are, I mean, saying I love you in Russian has got to sound like you... Almost, you know, just I'm going to kill you. I mean, there's well, just a yeah. serious language, you know, but uh, yeah. it's just it's like the Russians. They don't play around and they don't. No, no, they don't. They'll, they'll sort of kill you. Uh, the so thing is, when you when you operate in that industry, you don't operate in the shadows. You know yeah. where this comes from. I don't know. You operate into the as close to the truth as possible. Yeah. So they, side, I mean, yeah. let me tell you, they're better trained than we are. The, oh, the, the Russian. You know, the like, uh, FSB and, and uh, GRU. Like Rudy and all SBI, that. Yeah, they're better trained than we are. They're, they're that good at it. So don't be stupid and think you can match wits. Oh, when they do that, yeah. they wear disguises. You know, this guy that was wearing a disguise. This guy, I don't, where, where are they coming up with these people? He's wearing it. He gets caught with a disguise. <laughs> That's not how you operate. You don't operate that way. You don't keep notes. I don't want to give away trade secrets, though. Trade. Yeah, but I mean, it's just you know, you see, I mean, it's, you, I guess you. Have, it's going to be like a like a De Niro, like a, you have to be like a method actor. You have to live. You have to be that person because it, I mean, then people like people that are career criminals, you know, they can smell it on you. I'm sure if, if you're full of shit, no they question can about it. it. Yeah. You, you, I mean, you, uh, I mean, yes, there's a lot of acting involved, but you want to keep it as close to the truth as possible. One time, I screwed up over my birth site. You know, and, and a lot of these people are big into the occult. And I and I said I was a Gemini, but your birthday says July 6th or something like that. Well, what the hell do I know about uh, this? That's what you get from trying to fake it. <laughs> yeah, well, you can make mistakes, so you got to yeah. be very careful. you yeah. got to be very guarded. Hey, Ron, speak um, that, did you ever come close to be having your cover blown with the Russian Mafia? Not with the Russian Mafia, with the, with the Costa Nostra I did. They blew that on me. That's how I surfaced. That's how you ended up testifying in the end. Yeah. How, did that, how did that happen? How'd that go down? Well, 
I, I, you know, there, there's no question in my mind in the Bureau's mind, we know where it came from. And that was a former uh, employee of the U.S. federal government that I wanted to bring down. And I wrote nasty things about him in my book, hoping he would sue me so I could make all this public. <laughs> I did. I, I, I wonder if he was a, uh, he was a U.S. attorney. Let's put it that way. Not, he became attorney general for New York State. The nut that he was, you know, he was in, too tied up with the bot. And that's, we know where, like, can you prove it? No. You know, that's the problem, proving it. But we know where it happened. In fact, one mobster said, it's not coming from here, it's coming from over there. I mean, in the fact that you're, you're working for somebody. And then We're I found out there was, prize anybody. Yeah, then we found out there was going to be a hit on me, and I found out from a mobster that they were going to clip me. Man, how about? How about, I mean, how about know, I'm the type of guy. <laughs> I, you know, I'm the type of guy. I'm, you know, I'm, that, it's not that you're, you're you're fearless. It's just that maybe you've been through so much fear, you know, uh, you know, hard times in life. You learn how to endure those situations without panicking. Because if it were me, I'd start taking some of them out, except that it'd be yeah. an endless line. Where yeah. does it begin? Where does it yeah. begin? And where does it end? So, uh, I mean, the discretion's the better part of valor in life. That's one thing you learn. Be smart and, about. I bet. So, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, okay. The CIA. Let me get like, the CIA is not a domestic agency. They can't operate on the soil without a domestic agency, right? Well, no. In some cases, they have been able to, especially if it's their own personal property if their personal yeah. property is missing or uh some e external cases led to the united states then yes they can but it's the fbi's domain and the problem we always had is neither organization ended up getting along with each other oh yeah yeah they didn't like each other yeah the, the, the brothers and sisters so, so ron the first case that that you had to testify against what was that what was that concerning? what was my first case where you had to the actually first go in and case I actually testified in was in Binghamton against Gov Guarneri. Yeah, this uh, Gov was uh, was featured in the movie, the recent movie that uh, uh, about Russell Buffalino, because I knew uh, Russell quite well. You know, Buffalino was he. A lot of people don't know Russell Buffalino came out of the Magadino family. Yeah, he was a Magadino, yeah. and the Lennon Company they're talking about. And the De Niro movie is Camilla Lennon, which was owned by Magadino. Uh, so, I mean, but they got a lot wrong in that story, you know. Uh, yeah, that movie should have been 10 hours long. Well, the first thing I can tell you right now, they're not going to use some Irishman to take somebody out. Yeah, I don't really. care how close he is. It doesn't work that way. It, it just doesn't work that way out of hit. They're going to use somebody that's tried and true that they, they know will die for them. That's taken the oath, and that's how it works. And uh, I got to lean toward now. I don't know who killed uh, uh, Jimmy Hoff. I, I I met him once. I don't know who who killed him, but I can tell you this: it wasn't uh, a guy that paints walls. And De Niro, as you know, <laughs> I mean, we disagree politically, but he's a friend of mine. Yeah, no, he's a great. That's what that's. I'm 100 with you, Ron. He, he's a great actor, but I don't want to hear about who you want to punch. I don't. You're, you're an actor, act. That's I don't want to hear your fucking political views. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, 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 he, him and I argued over Hillary because I couldn't stand Hillary. But no, I'll be I, honest I, I, with yeah. you, I mean, I really don't like politics at all because I've seen too much corruption. It's a broad yeah. spectrum. And it's, oh, that, yeah, that and I think, you know, I, I think that's why Trump got elected in the first place because people are more tired of politicians. Yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, we, you get tired of it because there's so much abuse and we're the ones that suffer. So that's Oh, the yeah, problem. yeah. I, I mean, you know, they, left, left side or right side, it doesn't matter. They, we're both, we're all that's not on that side or fuck in the middle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know? hey, Ron, uh, yeah. now, as you started testifying, uh, did they, uh, how did they deal with you? You had to go around the country to some different trials that were, oh, yes. Uh, they started yeah. making cases. Yeah, the, that, yeah, you the were never in witness saw, protection, right? No, no. No. So how, how did they deal with you? They give you a per diem and you just kind of dealt for you. Yeah, I mean, yourself. somebody walked into myself. I walked into a Chicago case once and the mobsters were all out there greeting me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah they're out there greeting me. Uh, but but uh, the other ones, there were certain ones that, especially in Western New York, because there was a, a price on my head. And it's not the mob that you fear. It's the wannabes. Someone looking uh, to ingratiate himself with the mob is going to... Uh, come out there and try to clip you. That's what you had to be careful about. 
And so, you know, I mean, I have the best security still in the world. You'd be surprised. That's why I'm down in Williamsburg. I got the CIA here. <laughs> so we have, yeah. a, you know, we're, we're well, I, I, I'm not supposed to talk about my security, though. So, but it's, it's good. But it's not that I worry about it that much anymore. I mean, I meet mobsters all the time and we come up and shake hands and that. And sometimes you stare at each other and leave it at that. Uh, but no, I mean, the more of the Russia mafia, Al Qaeda, that I, I made the adversary. Yeah, that seems yeah, that's, that's, that seems like something else that's more thing yeah, to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that so that just seems like the dealing with the cousin Russia. Were you were you just bored and you said, hey, this is this isn't as dangerous as I've done before. So that's no, that's no, 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 no. It's not that I think a lot of it, believe it or not, is because you believe in it. You're doing a yeah. little bit of pig in country. Yeah, you do. Did, I mean, I'm not a money that? person. <laughs> I, if I were a money person, I wouldn't have a still owe one hundred ninety five thousand dollars on the mortgage of this. this <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you end up overseas with the Al Qaeda? Qaeda. Well, I got asked by the bureau to take my skills overseas. One time, I was teaching down at the FBI Academy, and Jim Moody told me uh, Jimmy Moody was the supervisor. Ronnie, we're going to get you off oh. your ass. You're you're getting out of here. You're going back to work. So uh, uh, Stan and I, who was a friend of mine, was transferred over to Eastern Europe, and uh, they uh, wanted me to start working over there. So that's how I ended up going over there. And I mean, it's nice. You get, I mean, it's not a luxury life. You're living on, you know, pennies. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like in the movie where you're wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> no James Bond stuff, <laughs> you know, like you said. So, yeah, so you, you get know, over it like that. Do they have some informants already developed that, that they want well, you, you develop into? your own? You, you develop, develop your, own. your own. You have to work your way into a different group, different people. And that's how you do it. It's just maneuvering. It's, it's no different than what you would do here, except at first they're very cautious. Yeah, they're going to be cautious. But then you tell them, listen, I've been in the industry, too. You know, they know. Like I said, don't think they don't know about you. They do. No. So you got you got to be as close to the truth as possible. Don't start creating a, a, a jacket that can't be verified because they're, they're going to they, they access our, our, our uh, computers all the time. And, and, and the truth of the matter is it's the Chinese today that are the bad players, no. not the Russians. Oh, no. The Chinese are the bad ones. I don't know how, you know, you know, they went under radar for so long. So these uh, Middle Eastern terrorists, uh, I guess, in, in their attempt to stay armed and, and get guns, and they have to deal with criminals, uh, with the Russian correct. mafia and, and other professional criminals. Is that, yeah. is that where you came into it? Uh, yeah, that's like yourself Gennady, off like that? Yeah, Gennady Troshev was a friend of mine. He was the commanding general of the uh, Russian army in Chechnya. And by the way, he helped me with that spy case that I was telling you about getting that guy off, that uh, former KGB officer that Anna Chapman coughed up. Uh, but uh, he told me one time, we're at a party, it's called the Best Managers Club. And there we were orchestrated in. Literally, they would have uh, people ring you in and Mr. So-and-so in Russian, they would say, Gospodin Ronald Fino, you know, Gospodin means Mr. So, uh, uh, him and I were there at the party and he was telling me, how do I fight an army or how do I fight a war by enemies that are equipped with equipment than I am? They had better equipment than he did and they're getting it from the Russian mob. So, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, so they've had their druthers also. Uh, and he was a good man. He's, he's dead now. He got uh, killed in a, plane, in a plane crash, I believe it was. Yeah. Gennady's dead. Was it a plane crash? I forget. I forget. But he, he was, he, uh, Putin didn't like him, so he sent him out to head up the, the Cossacks. So he left the Chechen army and went over there. But he was a friend. You know, he was a nice guy. Liked to drink. <laughs> I think they all do. <laughs> so this movie, Mr. Undercover, I've seen the trailer for it, and uh, uh, the document, I guess it's a documentary, and it is. you yeah. think that'll ever get Done or? Oh, I doubt it right now, the way things are going. I don't know. I keep getting to hear pushback. We're doing coloring. Then it's COVID. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. You know, they've, they've interviewed you, and, and they shot a lot of uh, yeah, uh, they had me traveling scenes. all over. Yeah, they had me going to Vegas. They had me going to Chicago. Uh, all over. Yeah. Well, the book is out there on uh, Amazon. 
guys. Yeah, I put the book out there. What happened is, you know, so people understand my original book, uh, the triangle exit was based on, you know, triangle exit stood for Quantico because that's where you would get off. Uh, It's the same book, except it's an updated version of Mr. Undercover. The problem I had is my uh, uh, editor was from overseas and disappeared with the money. (laughs) We could never see the money, so we had a. a we couldn't cancel the book because other outlets have it. Mm-hmm. So I have to. We have to somehow put a notice out there that it's the same book, except that it's an updated version of my life story, Mister Undercover. Well, interesting. Anybody else got any questions for Ron here? Yeah, well, Ron, you said your your dad was involved with the Buffalo mob. Yes, and he was. was he was he still around when you were getting into? You know, uh, testifying against them and stuff like not that. Not before I was not with testifying. He was he, he he was aware of me doing undercover work. He was he kept saying, "Ronnie, you're going to get killed. You're going to get killed. They're going to kill you." And I said, "I'll be worried about that, Dad." Because, like I said, we went through a somewhat of a role reversal at the end. He had lost his position, and literally, I was sitting at the front table with the mob, and he had to sit in the other room when I was called to a sit down. He was not allowed even to sit with his own son, you know. So he he was put down uh, after uh, there was a takeover of the family. Uh, originally, he was put up there so if there was going to be a hit on somebody that was going to be on him. Uh, they went to the commission, and the commission refused my father the position and uh, Tommy Eboli was the spokesman for the commission at that time. They would have different spokesmen. And uh, he said, no, you can't have it, Joe. So that eventually became Sammy Frenchabori, who was close to the Gambinos. He was allowed to take the position. Uh, and then eventually his nephew, Joey Tadaro, took over. Joe, I got along good with Joe Tadaro. I'll be honest with you. The kid I didn't get along with his kid, but his kid wasn't as bright as he is. I mean, he was a highly intelligent guy. And I talked to him. I used to tell him, Joe, this business is no good for you. I'd be honest. This no business is no good for you. You have to get, Ronnie, if I got out of this, I wouldn't have any of this. That's what he would say. So, Ron, what, what about Russell Buffalino? You had to know him pretty well. Oh, I know Russell real well. So tell, tell us about him, some of your experiences with him. And did Joe Pesci, did he carry that off pretty decent in the movie? I think you saw it. The, the yeah, no, I don't, it's hard to play Russell. Russell the, was very quiet. He was humble. He was a, he, he was a simple, nice guy. I, don't, he, I shouldn't say he's so simple because he was involved in killings, but he took his orders. You know, people have him listed as a boss, but he was more like what you might call a super couple because he still came out of the Buffalo family. He never... Uh, left the Buffalo family. No one ever gave him permission uh, to leave the Buffalo family. He, he, he was a, he was a Magadino. But remember, they all came under the Genovese back then. Buffalo was aligned with the Genovese. Magadino was aligned. My father was aligned. That's why uh, Tommy Ebel, he was the spokesman against my father. Uh, Pittsburgh was aligned. Cleveland was aligned. Uh, you know, a lot of times there'd be arguments even within the mob. Did they have many families or not as many? Some say San Jose had its own family. I never heard of that. But I mean, I would hear these stories. Sammy Pierre would tell me no. Uh, Sammy Pierre would talk to me more than my father would. And, and he was in the know. He was a powerful uh, mobster. And uh, he said that there's various choke points that would control them. They may have satellite families, similar how the FBI has RA offices, but it still comes under that one family or that, that dominant family. So the uh, Magadino, uh, the uh, Genovese had their power. They had uh, the Gambinos, Columbos. Bonanno family is the one family I never really got to know that well. And I don't know why, because Joe Bonanno wanted to take over Buffalo. And that's what led to the killing of his Johnny Camilleri. They invited Joe, uh, Joe Bananas to come in and, and, and take over because his cousin, because his cousin was Steve Magadino. Was, was, uh, did Magadino ever k- kidnap Bonanno? I don't know. That's a lot of bull crap. Uh, he never committed, uh, kid, uh, uh, kidnapped him. You know, so, I mean, you hear those stories. Yeah, uh, interesting. And, and he said that he was just the, the lamb. That's what it is. He was making an excuse uh, to why he didn't show up or to, to testify and honor the subpoena. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff. Uh, I mean, 
you know, that, I don't get, I, I normally don't, I don't like correcting authors because they're doing the best they can with a difficult subject. And I don't like, uh, you know, coming out against different people for, for doing things because we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. You know, I, I'm, I can only talk to the best of my knowledge. We all make mistakes. Who am I to be critical of somebody else? I don't do that. You know, I mean, you see things. I mean, you grow up with them. You get to know their energy. You get to know their family, uh, their habits, what they want to do. Russell would like to drive, like in the movie. He did drive. I didn't know anything about this sheer hand. I knew the Teamsters quite well because Joe Tears was. If anything happened with the, the Teamsters, it would have had to be Joe Tiratola. He was out in New York City. He ran the, the Teamsters uh, for, for the East Coast. So it wouldn't be this Frank Shearhand. Sure, he'd be a bit close to Jimmy Hoffa, and he may have been a buddy of his and did things, but I mean, not when it comes to the mob. I can tell you right now, he may have met some mobsters, and he, and he, and he, and he probably did meet uh, Russell because Russell was heavily in, involved down in Philly at that time, as well as through Pittston, Pennsylvania, with uh, a lot of us because a lot of the Buffalo family was down there back and forth. Uh, but no, he was not that type of person. I cannot picture Russell uh, outside of defending Magadino and defending uh, the, the Pittsburgh family that we had, which was another group, or even Cleveland. We we're all close to Cleveland. We're all tied together. The Great Lakes, ex excluding in Chicago and Detroit. Well, Detroit was pretty close to us, too. They were also tied in with the Genovese family. Oh, you know, Jack Toko and all those guys. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Zerilli and them, Zerilli's were cousins of Bagadino. <laughs> small world. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a yeah. Small I mean, world. It, it, you know, so is it one big family or is, is there a lot of small <laughs> ones? I mean, I don't know the answer myself because I've heard different stories from mobsters in the know, and they don't know. And I'm not just talking street <laughs> mobsters. Yeah. These are bosses, things of that nature. Uh, you know, street mobsters, they're always going to get the story wrong. You know, the, the, the wise guys, the regular wise guys, even the bosses and the consigliaries who are supposed to know the system get it wrong. It's like with the, the Genovese family. Who really headed up the Genovese family? Was, was it the Chin? Probably was Chin for a while, but who ran things? Tony Salerno? No, it could have been others. Because uh, I testified in the, the Mason Tedders case in New York with the, the various people, Gail and all those guys. Jimmy Massara, you know, he, he, he was running things as a couple. But did, did you testify you test that, like, uh, like, as kind of an expert on this is how it works. If this person did this, then he did it because somebody else told them, because you wouldn't have direct knowledge of a lot of those different things. He wouldn't, yeah. You weren't part of it. But. Well, I testified as an expert witness, even though, like I said, I don't believe in such things as experts, and I don't consider myself one. But the F, I qualified, I went through voir dire, and I qualified as an expert on organized crime, okay. as well as labor racketeering. I did that in the, the Liberatory case in Cleveland, Tony Liberatory. And that was a Jack Lacavelli case. And I also did it in, uh, with the Russell Buffalino case. Uh, that, that, not that it was Russell, his, his team, Gov Guineri, it was on trial down in Binghamton. Yeah, because to make these RICO cases, you have to make it into an organization. So to make it an organization, you have to have somebody who can say, yeah, this guy does this, and this guy can tell this guy to do something, and here's how I know. And, and I know in Kansas City, they had a guy named Ken Ito came down and testified about the Chicago outfit and who was who. Yeah, I knew him. I, I knew him, Ken Ito. Yep. Uh, so, no, uh, making RICO cases pretty difficult. Enterprise. Now, we've been successful with them, but a lot of times they don't want to use them uh, because the juries are reluctant to convict an enterprise. Yeah. The juries are reluctant. So, what they would do is bifurcate a case, they'd split it up into different uh, individual cases, or they'd try them all at once. Sometimes they'd be successful with a, a mass, such as they did in the commission case. Other times it's more difficult. Because you're, you're focusing on certain people, other people may just slip through the cracks. Yeah, you can't get everybody. No. Many times. No, you're the bad guy. When you take the stand, I mean, I've been beat up more times on the stand. One, oh, one time, 
taken to the stand for seven days under cross-examination. And even the judge, who I happen to know, was one after him. Ronnie, so help me, call me Ronnie. He says, Ronnie, so help me God, I'm going to hold you and contempt the court if you keep answering the guy that way. I says, Your Honor, it's misleading. He has a right to mislead. <laughs> so I would try to go as far as I could without crossing the line. To make yeah. It. Yeah, one time I had a lawyer say, well, he says, read this. You wrote it. Read that. And I did. I says, in order to understand what you just gave me, you have to read the paragraph above it. Oh, he went ballistic. How dare you do those things? That's up to that man over there. He's pointing to the prosecutor. It's up to him to do that, not you. I says, but Ron, he's misleading. That's what he did. He ended up misleading. So, so I, you know, I fought on the stand. I was like that. And a lot of times I, like, I used to like to leave landmarks. What I meant by that is when you do a 302, you want to keep it brief. Yeah. You don't want to have everything out there because you have to answer for everything. What happens is if you don't put everything out there, sooner or later, that defense attorney is going to step right into it. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. I didn't bring this up. You know, now we open the door. Now you can bring out something new that they're not prepared. So when you, it's, it's, it, this is a legal game. I mean, it's a really a legal match of wits. You have to not just go with what the attorneys want. You have to prepare how you're going to defend yourself because you're, believe it or not, even though you're not in trial, you have to defend uh, yourself against those onslaughts to make it you look bad. So as a result, you look at landmines that they can walk right in and then they can nail themselves. The art of testimony, that should be just something that, I don't know if you could ever teach that or not. Oh, they, they teach it in the, the continuing legal education classes. I've had a couple of those on the yeah, art, well, art of cross-examination. I, I don't know if they teach it to professional government witnesses or not, but I think you guys learn it. I wouldn't teach a professional government witness, but I would teach FBI agents. <laughs> court preparation, let's yeah. put it that way. I would work on court preparation uh, for the stand, what to do, how to prepare, how was the weather outside that day, because they're going to trip you up on simple things. You don't remember that day? Here you're out of the car, you're doing this. You don't remember the weather? You know, any little thing to trip you up. I mean, you got some of these attorneys are pretty damn good at doing that. So you have to be prepared for those things. Yeah, especially if you're like an expert witness. It's kind of subjective what you're testifying to anyhow, rather than something that's objective. Yeah, the key is to be honest. Yeah. If, if you're not honest, you will fail. You, I guarantee you, sooner or later, you're going to fail. You'll self-destruct. <laughs> so, I mean, that's one thing I could tell people. Yeah. And I would tell agents that all the time. <laughs> Don't be fooled by uh, telling somebody to expound on more than what he knows because he's only walking into a disaster and so yeah. are you. The U.S. attorneys are pretty sharp on that. I had to testify once. I watched uh, a guy write a check to one of our mob bosses. And he, I, yeah. It was in a restaurant and, and they had this case it's kind of an involved, complicated, uh, white collar crime case. I saw this kid who was connected to him in business scribble out a check and tear it off and hand it to him at across uh, the the restaurant. Yeah. And, and so they called me in, and, and Oscar Goodman is came to Kansas City to oh, defend yeah. this guy. It was uh, 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 Tony Wright, uh, Anthony Savella, and I thought, oh man, I'm going to be cross examined by. Uh, Oscar Goodman. <laughs> so the, the uh, U.S. Attorney, they got me in there uh, uh, the day before, and they browbeat the heck out of me. I mean, they went back and forth and back and forth and asked me questions about what I saw that day, 18 different ways. And they're at, like, I thought, well, they were actually mad at me. You know, they were really about browbeating the shit out of me. <laughs> and so yeah, then we got that. Yeah. And, and, and I go in the next day and and I tell, and I'm like petrified, like, oh my God, you know, and I walk into this big courtroom and there's all these mob guys, all of his family and conf yeah. Confederates are sitting out there in the audience watching. And I get up and he, he just asked me, you know, uh, Detective Jenkins, uh, you, you, test, you know, they asked me direct first. And I said, I said well, Officer Jenkins or Detective Jenkins, did you actually see uh, Mr. Savella what he wrote on that piece of paper? And I said, no, I couldn't tell. He said, I said, he just wrote on it. And he said, well, well, what made you think that, you know, that was a check that he was writing? Of course, they had the check. 
And I yeah. said, well, you know, he got that right on it. Then he, he ripped it out and handed it to him. It looked like a check to me. And he just said, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No further yeah. questions. But, like, well, that was a non-issue uh, there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happens. They got to be careful. You know that. They have to be yeah. careful with their questions because they know uh, they, they could easily walk into a, a minefield. Yeah. Like, uh, don't, ask, don't, don't ask a question you don't, you don't know the answer to. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. They got me one other time. The judge even, <laughs> judge even ripped me one time. We, we'd gotten some trash from some people just for intelligence purposes. And so, you know, we kind of figured out a little bit about what they were doing. They're professional boosters, boosting uh, mainly high-end art things like uh, Love yeah. Crystals and things like that. So we just got some of the other cities. They had match books and some stationery and stuff from other cities they'd been in. Then we'd call up to those cities and said, hey, have you had any you know, any boosters, like we call down to Tulsa and we find out that uh, that there had been a male and female booster team had ripped off a fur at a fur shop and the woman had gotten the fur and was starting out the door and the man, when the clerk saw him, they started to go towards the woman and the man blocked her off, called the block and tackle method, blocked off yeah. the clerk and, and then they got on out with the fur. So, so, you know, we they ended up, we made a kind of a whole big case. They got uh, some of the people they were selling this stuff to to testify against them. But they went back to this trash that we'd gotten. Well, I didn't keep that trash. You know, I looked at it and made some notes and threw it away. <laughs> and they said, well, where's the trash, detective? I said, we threw it away. I told the U.S. attorney the day before, he was asking me about it. I said, we threw it away. We didn't keep that. We were gathering intelligence. We didn't know where we were going at the time. We were just kind of poking around. And, the dumpster diving. Yeah, and, and, and they just kept diving. leaning on me about where that trash was and what did I do with it. And finally, the judge interrupted them, and, and the U.S. attorney was objecting. The judge interrupted the defense, and he said, obviously, if this was a competent officer, he would have cataloged that trash and put it in the property room, and obviously, he didn't. Now, can we move along? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh man. Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> man. I know one time I had a case where, you know, we were dumpster diving. This was not a, a, a mob case. This was a, we call an alter ego where an employer was operating and uh, double breasted under two different names, union, non-union. And we went dumpster diving and we got all the printout sheets for everything. And all we had to do was show common carrier. Now that we kept. I hired two uh, law students to assist me on this, but uh, we put together a case. And then the mob pulled me off of it. The mob was always pulling me off because they were getting kickbacks. Yeah. <laughs> always. Anything I worked in, uh, you know, the, like they would tell me, Ronnie, this is when I would tell them it's the you know, members union. It's not their union. It's our union. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd get that a lot. I would get that a lot. Well, but any I'm other questions? It. Here it is. You can't be tough and you want to be tough. Yeah. But you can't. There's too many of them. Yeah, hey, Ron, you know, Gary was start, so, uh, telling some stories about the Kansas City involvement. Uh, did you have any cross paths with any Kansas City outfit guys? Yeah, Kansas City and Missouri. Most of them were associates. I didn't know. I don't recall if I ever met Sevilla. Uh, a lot of times what the, the way we handled Kansas City back then was through Chicago. Everything was tied through Chicago. And uh, then I, we had St. Louis. Uh, that we would deal with. Uh, we would go through that as well to go to some of those areas. But Kansas City, no, I never dealt directly with the Mr. Villas of that. Not that, I mean, I had some labor unions down there I dealt with, you know, and, and uh, uh, that handled all that. Rich Jack Wilkinson was a mob associate. He was a front man, and he would handle that area for the labors, but I dealt with the Teamsters, and I dealt with Rose Steel down there where it was all corrupt. In Kansas, if you recall that, the Roseland Steel, that was an area that was handled by the, the mob where they dumped all the PCBs, phenols, and dioxin at Rose Chemical, it was called. And, and, and Bob Dole ended up getting involved with that. Somebody, mm -hmm. an associate without Jack Kemp's knowledge, his associate went to Bob Dole to help him help this mob contractor out, and he unwittingly did so. And that was at Rose Chemical. That was a, a quite a damaged area. Yeah, I don't all remember that. that. Yep. Hey, I, I have a like, question they were about... They canal people. These were left canal experts. Yeah. And they yeah. made a fortune. They were paying off more politicians <laughs> than in half the country here. 
Uh, I mean, D'Amato and I had it out. That's where I'm, see, that's where a lot of these people came from, El D'Amato. El D'Amato was mobbed up in New York State. And, and, and a lot of these people were under his protection. So that controlled New York. I mean, he was that tied in. Uh, a, a lot of others uh, were too. It's like uh, with Cuomo with the father. I mean, not that he was a mobster, but members of his family were. I knew Mario. I'm not talking about the kids now. I knew yeah. the father and Matilda, his wife. I met. There's pictures of us around together out there somewhere. There's also pictures with me and Mayor Koch from New York. And there's also pictures of me with Mayor Belandic. So I was like a front guy, you know, because I was supposed to be the clean face. And that's why the mob wanted to keep me, because he was clean. They wanted to keep me clean. They didn't want me getting involved. In fact, I was sat down one time when Sammy Pieri started getting me involved in something. And uh, they didn't want that. They wanted to keep me clean so they could move me further up. Little did they know that I just didn't like the mob. I, I, I don't like abusive people. I've always been, I, think, I don't know, ever since I was a child, when my father was in jail, we lived poor. The manager of Joe Lewis, Marshall Miles, had to take me in during the summer. Now, he was just as corrupt as my father. He ran the numbers rack in Western New York. And uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, I grew up with an Afro-American family. I grew up with a lot of people. You know, we, you learn to respect each other. And, and, and the bottom line is it came down to that. It, it really was. And, you know, it's, it's something inside of me. That's why I've never been a money a money maker. I don't have any money now. I, I, I had to get to 10000 out of the SBA to keep me going during this coronavirus. I'm like that, though, and I'm happy like that. I'm not because I've, I've lived a simple life financially, but I've lived a good life. I got to be candid. I lived a good life. I couldn't live it any other, other way with my big mouth. Where am I going? Yeah, you because know, I got a big mouth. Yeah, I feel like Jack and Lisa, I got jump. a big mouth, huh? You sound like you're an action junkie to me. You sound like the actions are fun for you, yeah. Well, no, I just, I mean, I believe in people. I really do. I understand yeah. that. I believe in people. I believe in respect of people. And it, that's always been big to me since I was a child. Uh, you know, protect women, protect children, like you, you, you normally you would. Yeah. I'm into that. I'm doing, you know, pro bono cases now. A guy that served 16 years in jail, I'm finding out was innocent. I'm working yeah. on that. I'm, I'm doing another one. I do pro bono, and I do I do pay cases too. I have well, it sounded like you were stuff. motivated to protect the members, the laborers. Yeah, I, think, I think that did a lot of it. Yeah, I think it did because I've seen a lot of abuse, and I don't like abusing people. Yeah. And when you're 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 taking someone else's money that can't yeah, even that's... afford. I had an Irish, a Polish worker come up to me once, and he got down on his hands and knees when I was walking into the union hall, and he's pleading with me to get him a job. And he tells me he can't even buy a dress for his daughter's graduation. I go into the union hall and there were two slips there. And one was for Joe Tadaro, one was for Danny Sanzanese's cousin. I told the secretary, give me the slip. And I gave him a slip and sent him to work. And boy, did I get it. I got pinned against the wall. Who the F do you think you are? You know, you can't give those slips away. Even though I was the business manager of the union, you can't give. And this is a decent guy. This is a guy that's crying that he can't buy a daughter. For his, I mean, some people just don't have feelings, I guess. I don't know. I got feelings. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I like about the mob. I've never really understood it, like extortion. You know, the, the extortion, if somebody wants to come loan money or, you know, like borrow money or buy this or that from you, if they come to you, that's one thing. But going to somebody and, you know, doing the old break your window, well, I could fix that. Yeah. That's just preying on your own, preying on any people is just bad. If they yeah. come to you and they need something, that's one thing. That's just like a business deal. But just preying on people, I agree with you 100% on that. Just preying yeah, on people that's trying to get by. That's, yeah, that's they eat the, really right. yeah, they eat the innocent. That, that's yeah. the thing. They eat the innocent. I mean, you, you talk about the Italian people. The Italian people suffered more than anybody at the hands. Oh, yeah. Them. Oh, yeah. Like, so, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's, I mean, how, you know, so, I mean, today you see a lot of people justifying it. Oh, that's a great life. I want to be in something like that. Or, uh, you know, looking. Oops. <laughs> I think, I think Rod just <laughs> dug himself up. <laughs> yeah, they, they sooner than they oh, there get killed. There yeah. yeah, they get killed quicker than you think they, they will. <laughs> yeah, this I mean, rock I mean, line keeps falling. I mean, if it's a criminal involved with the criminal thing, that that's one thing. But preying on innocent people, that's not right. Yeah, That's and people right think, well. you know, they glamorize the Bob. You see that. Oh, yeah. Mean, see it. You, oh, they yeah. don't know. They have no they don't, they don't show you after the prop that after that door closes and then whenever 
the afterwards. Yeah. They don't show you like you know they don't show you the afterwards at all. And that's like either the, all the jobs I've had working overseas at Intel. They glamorize that. They make it into this glamorous job. Yes, I mean, you get to visit a lot of nice places that you've never been before. But I guarantee you, the whole hotel you're staying in is the cheapest oh. hotel in town. <laughs> <laughs> you're not eating at the finest restaurant. Well, uh, the other thing is, uh, it's like private detectives. They see all these movies. They, they think it's a glamorous. It's a tough racket. You have to be court prepared. I start my cases from court backwards because I have to be court prepared for every one of them. Uh, it's it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of tedious work, and I, I and I avoid uh, divorce cases and things of that nature. Uh -huh. Custody, that's not my my forte. And I avoid surveillance. I've always hated surveillance. I don't want to sit in a car all day. So uh, I I do you know I'll, I'll, I find missing people or what I'll do is corporation cases, uh, criminal cases, things of that nature. I do a lot of. Do you work for uh, defense lawyers. Oh, I work for all, almost all the defense go, lawyers down in town here. Go back and and go back and find witnesses and make sure that the yeah, the I, I, the straight yeah. I do it for the state also. The state yeah. will hire me once in a while uh, to work on certain cases. I get hired by the judges, but almost all the, the attorneys in Williamsburg, Virginia, and a number of them in Newport News, and that I work for. I don't want to yeah. travel too far because I'm overwhelmed. I don't even advertise. Yeah. Because I get, I'm getting calls constantly, and I just can't do it. I'm working seven now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, but you know, I'll have my son do some surveillance, but he doesn't know the business. Yeah. You know, first of all, I recommend going to law school if you want to be a private detective. That's not police work; it's law. That's you have to start with that aspect of it. Then you have to learn the investigative techniques, what to do. That's in the second field. So you're going beyond. You're doing legal work. Even though you're not practicing as an attorney, you're doing legal work in preparation and, and you're doing the investigative work. So it's, it's uh, you know, a detective would be good for the job or someone that's been experienced with courts, things of that nature, because you have to make presentations and you have, you have to learn how to write because you have to write those reports and you have to know how to speak because you're, you're going on the stand. <laughs> it's not the Humphrey Bogart type of movies. Really? Yeah. All right. Well, that's a very fascinating thing. Yeah, absolutely. We've been here about 75 minutes, guys. So, uh, anybody uh, got any more questions for Ron here? One last shot. No, that's, oh, that's, thanks for doing it, Ron. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, you're welcome. All what, right. a life, Sorry, like, <laughs> what a lot of people had, man. Yeah, oh, I man. wish I had a better camera for you guys. So this one, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, holding we, my cell phone now with my hand. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, we see your name. <laughs> <laughs> we know what you're looking Ron, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank Anytime, you, Ron. you guys. Thank you, Ron. It was very enjoyable. All right. Yeah, thanks. And you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Okay, everybody everyone. have a good Thanksgiving. Too. Too. Yeah. Thank right. you, Gary. Good night. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Gary. Thanksgiving, gentlemen. All right. Have a Thanksgiving. Bye. 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 Well done.